Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all doing really well. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but it seems to be comeback season on YouTube right now. And I don't know if it's because there's like something in the air or maybe because it's summertime, everyone's coming back, but it seems like a lot of YouTubers that had left the platform because of some massive scandal or controversy have all decided to come back at nearly the exact same time. And I kind of feel like it's the perfect ranking opportunity. A lot of these comebacks are going to be recent ones, but I did want to sneak in a few old ones too, but they're all comebacks in their own special way. Before we start today's video though, I did want to give a quick shout out to Grammarly, who sponsored today's video. Some of you guys might remember that I have talked about Grammarly before. They're a digital writing assistant that's helped 30 million people write more clearly and effectively every day, and I've actually been one of them for a few years now. School is coming up, and back in university, Grammarly was honestly a must for me when it came to any kind of writing assignment. And that's because they've got free features like the setting goal one that helps make sure the tone of your writing is tailored to the audience you're trying to write to, and they even have a free word count feature, which is super helpful for essays so you don't have to keep track of whether you've hit the word count or not. Plus the synonym feature finds new words for you to sub in for ones that you might be overusing. It's super easy to use as well. All you have to do is download the browser extension and while you're writing, Grammarly will be double checking in the background to make sure you have no spelling, grammar, or punctuation mistakes or errors. And since it's free, you pretty much have nothing to lose. I did recently upgrade to Grammarly Premium a few months ago, and I've noticed that it's helped my writing become a lot more compelling and professional, and it's also just helped me become a lot more efficient in my writing, which is very helpful for me considering a few months ago I couldn't write an email without ending every sentence with an exclamation point. I was just very excited all the time for some reason. If you get premium though, you get vocabulary and clarity suggestions, and I found those two features especially helpful because they're the most common issues I've had with my writing. Like, I can be a bit wordy, but it's definitely helped me become a lot more clear and concise, and it doesn't really take that much time or work on my end because it's Grammarly giving me the suggestions in real time. But regardless of whatever option you choose, your writing's gonna benefit because it's honestly the equivalent of having a writing professor whispering tips into your ear while you're writing. With back to school season coming up though, you can make sure you're prepared with tools like Grammarly by going to grammarly.com slash Yonzo to sign up for a free account and if you want to get those extra features, you can upgrade to Grammarly Premium for 20% off to help you save time and work more efficiently. Thanks again to Grammarly for sponsoring today's video. I would definitely check it out if you're interested in the link down below, but otherwise let's get to the video. I do want to put a quick disclaimer here before we start the video. I feel like it kind of goes without saying, but it's also the internet, so I feel like nothing ever really does. But I'm not ranking the things that cause these people to have their downfalls. I'm just ranking their ability to come back. Now that we have that out of the way, if you've been here before, you probably know that before we can start ranking everything, we have to introduce the tiers because we like to customize them around here. The first tier that we have is the failed reputation era tier, and this is basically for anybody who tried to lean into the I'm a villain and I like it kind of energy that is similar to how Taylor Swift did it during her reputation era, where like people called her a snake, so she turned into one. But I also think this kind of tier fits any comeback where someone was returning with a ton of receipts or just this plan that they were gonna come back and be well received and it just didn't land. Next we have the go girl give us nothing tier which is for any kind of comeback where it almost doesn't even really feel like a comeback because something happened, people got pissed about it, but the person that was at the forefront of it just didn't really acknowledge it or care. So in the end it didn't even really kind of register. Like everybody was pissed but they were just over in the corner dancing like Dua Lipa. Yes, go girl, give us nothing. Moving on, we have my personal favorite tier out of the ones we'll be using today, and that's the Pleak tier. I can't remember if it was a YouTube comment or a tweet, but someone had noticed in my ranking videos, I'll always have one tier where I'm like, this is a super niche tier. Like you have to have a super specific energy to land here, and then it ends up being the most popular tier in the list. And I kind of have a feeling this is gonna be that tier for this video. Cause in my head, I always feel like there's gonna be no one who ends up here, but then it always ends up flooded. To actually get into this tier though, you have to have bleak energy. So that could either be during your downfall or during your comeback. And if you're a bit confused by what I mean by bleak, allow me to introduce you. Bleak. So pretty straightforward, right? After the bleak tier, we have fan base privilege, which is for anybody who technically did have a downfall, but their fan base is so you know, that they probably could have kicked a puppy and it wouldn't have mattered. Finally, we have the OK Miss Taylor Swift tier, and I'd say that this tier is probably the only one where if you land here, your comeback was successful for the most part. Like, you're pretty universally accepted online these days. I'm not saying that everybody loves them or accepts their apology if they had to give one, but for the most part, they're seen in a good light. So now that we have the tiers out of the way, I think we should start with something a little low-key. 
David Dobrik. The downfall of David Dobrik, and I guess you could also argue the vlog squad, I feel like was such a collective experience on the internet. Like, I feel like there wasn't a single corner of YouTube that wasn't watching or commenting on what was going on. If you don't know the whole story, I don't really feel comfortable airing it all out in this video because there are so many videos that did such a great job at cataloging everything as well as articles. So I'll link them in the pinned comment below if you're curious and I definitely recommend you check them out. But the gist of it is that David had created an unsafe work environment for the people who routinely showed up in his vlogs as well as the fans too. So as more people came out with their experiences with the vlog squad David Dobrik, shit hit the fan, apology videos were made and remade, and technically David didn't take a break because of it because he had already been on one, but he did come back shortly after all the controversy. And what I found so interesting about David's comeback is that as he just returned to doing vlogs like normal, his comment section was almost completely normal as well, which I feel like it's kind of weird because usually no matter how big of a YouTuber you are, if you have a massive scandal, your first few videos back, the comment section will still be a bit dodgy, but for the most part his were just people relieved that they could watch his vlogs again. His views are down compared to his old videos, but I feel like that honestly has more to do with the fact that he took a year long break than anything because his apology video didn't even do as well as his old vlogs. Which again, I feel like is rare because usually when massive YouTubers have massive scandals, their apology videos usually end up doing insanely well or end up being the most popular video on their channel. I do think that the general opinion of David Dobrik being this unproblematic YouTube poster child has dissolved since everything happened. Even though there are a lot of people who don't like him anymore and don't watch his content, there are clearly a lot of people who are still sticking around. Down. So I think he belongs in fan base privilege. Next we have James Charles, which was definitely a very recent comeback. He had taken a break from YouTube after multiple underage boys and fans had shared their stories of how he had tried to get with them. And that mixed with the fact that he had been accused of this before and he convinced the internet that he hadn't done it made this whole thing blow up. I think out of all the tears, if you had asked me where to place him like a few months ago, if this had happened, I honestly think I would have put him in fan base privilege because I would have expected his fan base to just blindly support him. But watching everything happening right now, I feel like he actually belongs in failed reputation era because while he is back to posting, a lot of people aren't happy about it and feel like he shouldn't have a platform at all. And I know this isn't a funny situation, but the fact that he followed up his acknowledgement video with baking, I have no words. He really went like, yeah, I know I groomed those boys and all, but I'm really sorry and I brought cookies. Moving on though, we have Tana Mojo, and I do want to quickly say, if you haven't watched this video, please go watch it, because it really reminded me of just how much stuff Tana Mojo has gotten herself into, and how she has one of the strongest go girl give us nothing energies I've ever seen. And what's more surprising is how successful she's been with it. She has single-handedly gotten into almost every kind of drama you possibly could. Like, the spectrum of scandal, Tana Mojo has probably experienced all of it. And what's crazy to me is that her whole tactic of either not acknowledging it at all, or maybe saying an apology video is coming, but it never does, or giving a half-assed apology works almost all of the time. And her fan base just continues supporting her. And I think that combination is just why she's able to do whatever she wants, because if she doesn't want to acknowledge it and her audience doesn't either, she's able to just continue what she's doing, pull in the numbers she wants to, and so on and so forth. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that she definitely has fan base privilege. Like, people are still being scammed by her in 2020, by choice. Her audience is practically saying, go girl, give us nothing. So I think this tier fits like a glove. Okay, now we have Laura Lee, who I would argue has one of the most memeable downfalls out of all the people we're ranking today, which I know sounds deranged, but her video of her crying still is used as a reaction video to this day. I'm so sorry. What exactly beauty gurus have so much to fight about in comparison to every other corner of YouTube is beyond me, but the whole downfall of Laura Lee was because of a combination of things. It all started when Shane Dawson dropped his Jeffree Star documentary, and in one of the episodes, Jeffree had said that people think he's toxic, but he inferred that his friends were actually the issue, and unprompted, Gabriel Zamora decided to post this tweet and winded up getting everybody in that photo cancelled. I just can't even imagine how awkward that plane ride home was because they were all in a brand trip together. In Laura's case, she had some pretty gross tweets from 2012 resurface on her Twitter account, and that's how we got this infamous apology video. Years past that situation though, it seems like her comeback is actually pretty solid. Like she just sticks to her makeup content, minds her business, doesn't really entertain anything outside of it. And even though it is a good comeback, I do want to put her in pleek though, because they're just so similar, okay? Give me a break. I'm putting her in pleek. Dream is another semi-recent one. 
He's the Minecraft guy with the smiley face, which I know it sounds super shady, but that's literally the best way to describe him. He recently got into trouble because he was accused of cheating during one of his speed runs. It was a matter of probability on a few item drops that really helped his time, and a lot of people just felt it was impossible for him to get that lucky that often. A lot of people do think that he cheated by rigging the system to make sure it dropped certain items, but it is one of those things where it's impossible to prove unless he actually admitted it, but his actual fan base didn't even flinch. Which in fairness, I don't think they'd flinch at most things, honestly. So. I think he belongs to the fanbase privilege, dear. There's just something about those eyes. So mysterious and full of wonder. We have so many beauty gurus to rank, I'm so sorry, but the next one is Tati, who I think definitely took one of the longest breaks post downfall compared to anybody else for ranking. Basically what happened is that she tried to cancel James Charles, James Charles Una reversed her, she left the internet, came back and cried, then left again, and now she's fully back. And I have to say, if we're ranking her ability to come back, She's giving okay Miss Taylor Swift. Like, she came back with a video, said she's gonna be sticking to makeup content and going back to usual uploads, and she's sticking to it. Like, she's been uploading like crazy. I think her ability to come back like this and for it to actually work has a lot to do with the fact that she grew her following by being this drama-free YouTuber who only focused on makeup. So when she came back and said she was only gonna be doing that, a lot of people were excited because she was one of the biggest channels that only focused on the makeup and nothing else. Okay, we have one more beauty guru and then we're done with them, I promise. But if we're already mentioning people like James and Tati, I also wanna rank Jeffrey. I'm sure you guys know exactly where this guy's going. He's literally been cruel to his own fans and they've continued to support him. So yeah, fan base privilege. Gabby Hanna's comeback is technically still ongoing because she's releasing her documentary, which I think would be better branded as a really long vlog, but I don't think it's too early for me to put her in the failed reputation era tier. She more than anybody on this list definitely tried to lean into the whole I'm a villain and I'm crazy label that she felt people online had given her by posting videos like these on TikTok. And I don't wanna hear, I'm acting different. All I have learned from love is how to shoot somebody. Oh, Which I definitely think was an odd choice, but her documentary in general just hasn't really been received well, especially considering that she has YouTubers that could not be further from confrontation or drama coming out of the woodwork to make hour-long response videos to the things that she's saying about them. So I'd say it's a pretty bang-on example of a failed reputation era, because I think that she went into it thinking a lot of people would have changed their minds, but it seems like she's made the situation even worse. Moving on, I know that Shane Dawson hasn't even really come back yet. Like, yeah, he showed up in his fiance Ryland's vlogs every so often and he posts on Instagram about merch drops, but in terms of actually returning to YouTube on his channel, he hasn't done that yet. But you cannot tell me that this Instagram story doesn't give Pleak energy. And you also can't stop me from putting it on this list. Like one cake decorating Italian once said, you can't tell me what to do, I'm the cake boss. I'm very curious to see how his actual comeback will go though, because he had one of the biggest downfalls in YouTube history and that has to register at some point. But he also had a massive audience and still has a pretty strong core audience. And there's a lot of crossover between his audience and Jeffree Star's and Jeffree still has a ton of fans too. See, this is exactly what I meant by that disclaimer earlier, because these two comebacks could not be more different from each other, but they're in the exact same tier. Like Laura Lee pleaked, but Shane Dawson is pleaking. You know? Next we have Trisha Paytas, who kind of reminds me of Tana Mojo in terms of the amount of controversies they've gotten into and the style of comeback they use. Sometimes they acknowledge it, a lot of the time they don't, and they just continue moving forward with their lives and their core audience continues to stick around. I would definitely say that the Frenemies arc was very interesting to watch because it seemed like they were very well received by a lot of people, like more than ever on the internet. I wouldn't say that they have full fan base privilege because I feel like when they do get in controversies, you can see their own fans criticizing them. So I think it's a better fit that they're in Go Give Us Nothing because they kind of usually just move on from the controversy and continue cosplaying as a Domino's employee or actually more recently Starbucks, apparently. The last comeback we're gonna rank today is definitely one of the biggest ones because it actually hit national news. And while Logan Paul might have had a severe and continuous lapse in judgment, he's really come back from it. We all know the forest story at this point, so I'm not gonna bore you with it, but since that, Logan has really changed the way that he operates online. He doesn't do daily vlogs anymore, he focuses on boxing and his podcast, and they all seem to be doing really well. Which, considering all that, I feel like he belongs in the OK Miss Taylor Swift tier. Which is crazy, because I remember back during the forest thing, 
a lot of people did expect him to come back, myself included, but not to this extent. Like, he's still doing great. What's really interesting to me, though, is that both Logan and Tati are pretty good examples of successful comebacks, but their style of doing it could not be more different from each other. Tati came back and was successful with it because she went back to her roots, while Logan Paul did something completely different than what got him famous in the first place. And I feel like that really goes to show that comebacks are not a one-size-fits-all. It obviously depends on what you did, but also how well you know your audience in order to come back from it. And that's clearly a skill that some people have, and some people really don't. Curious to know where you guys would rank everybody though? Feel free to leave it in the comments down below if you want. And if anybody has a clue on why everybody decided to come back at the exact same time, I'd love to know because I'm currently stumped. Like, it almost feels like they coordinated it. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, feel free to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out. You can also turn my post notifications on if you want to be updated every single time I upload. Or you can follow me outside of YouTube on Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch, which are all at Casey Yonzo. I will be back on Twitch soon, I promise. But in the meantime, I'll see you guys in the next video.